view, we can see it. What did Raffles really see at that point? One thing we definitely know he has seen through his own eyes was the Tomogo Abdul Rahman's residence. So we got that little picture, right? The little kid sketch earlier. But this is one of the first document that shows a little palace complex. It actually says palace. So if you really zoom in, it says palace. Right at the Emperor's Place area. So this is a very good footprint. Now, a word of caution about this built map itself. Uh, yes, it's a map, per se, manuscript map, hand colored maybe, but there are, it's part map, part plan. Because on it, where the raffles or the administrators back uh, in early Singapore actually planned for certain things to happen, but it never did. Otherwise, the rest of it are factual ground truth things, like things like the Tobongo's residence, uh, the hill and the topography and things like that, the plantations, the Gambia plantations, this is quite uh, accurate. So that little area there is the Tumongong's uh, residence or the old village or town of Singapore. Remember this image we showed you, the very first <coughs> sketch of Singapore on 7 February. So that's a little village in Singapore right there. Uh, well, so that's our interest in, that, in early Singapore, that's archaeologists. We started looking around that area. Uh, not so much as trying to find Tumungum Abu Rahman's palace, but to see what sort of remains they may be. So we did a little uh, uh, probing around. Uh, as you probably know that now, Victoria Concert Hall is undergoing a major uh, retrofitting uh, exercise. And so before that, we managed to persuade the people involved with that to let us investigate the site in 2010. And in 2011, when we tried to salvage as much as possible, a very massive area. In the back there, this is Old Parliament Lane. On the left is the Victoria Concert Hall, the rear of it. And uh, on to my right, it's the Old Parliament House, the Arts House. So this is the roadway that used to run between these two buildings. Uh, but right now, they are putting in a major, a massive underground auditorium. So before that, we managed to take a little portion of it. And uncovered all sorts of things. Uh, nothing from the Raffles period, unfortunately, but a little bit of brick from the assembly hall, the old assembly hall. But it's just prior to independence, they have this uh, assembly hall. But we did find Spanish dogs. So, well, I won't say that they are Tomongo Raman's $3,000, right? But at least you know how it looks like. This is a real Spanish real silver real. Now, maybe a little, uh, I, I sidetracked a little and talked a little bit about money. So we, most people, a lot of people do ask me these questions, and they say, why, why are they using dollars or Spanish dollars or Mexican dollars? Well, it's a, it's a standard trading uh, currency in, in the Asia Pacific region. So, you know, you, you know the, the, um, the Spanish has, has conquered Mexico, right? And uh, parts of South America, they're mining all the silver and they're exporting it across uh, all to Philippines, Manila, and stuff. So, this became the standard currency. And you see it in the 19th century, it's always used, uh, used in this area in, uh, in the opium war and stuff. Chinese were exporting out the silver. And the silver was the standard currency that's being in use. Of course, the Indian rupee is used, uh, or Chinese copper cash and everything, but it's always equivalent to the, the, the silver, uh, silver dollar, so to speak. So, there are a lot of silver dollars floating around at that time the Japanese silver dollars, the American silver dollars and all sorts of things. Uh, like the, chi the Chinese had this Chinese silver tail, and then there's a 1,000 copper cash equals to one silver tail, right? So there's a, there's a unit of measurement, of course, about how much silver to, to the dollar. So this is the, the unit of currency being used for trade back then in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, other things that we find, copper cash, yes, so lots and lots of these Chinese copper cash, they are smaller de denominations. Um, um, some evidence of uh, metal working in, in that area. Uh, we don't know what this is yet, we haven't analyzed it. Glass beads and bangles, uh, even shell that's been worked. So someone's been collecting on the shell and reworking them into jewelry or some form. At least you can see the material to be strung across. Uh, various pieces of uh, ceramics with uh, Chinese and manufacturing marks. And one of the earliest game pieces in Singapore, it's a Chinese uh, chess piece, uh, uh, Chinese general, right, to the shrine. So there's two characters, I think one of them is the Jiang and the other one is the shrine, so along those lines. Oh, various other types of ceramics and things are all uncovered in the area. Very, very nice, the uh, Yuan Dynasty blue and white face. So it's amazing what you can find just before uh, a construction uh, uh, at the construction site, right? 
Well, occasionally they find things like that and just construction workers think that they're bombs, but they're not. They're just little water bottles. So they, they look something like that. Today's, uh, those are the predecessor of those cat bottles. So they were very frequent in the 14th century. Now, okay, so this is the area which uh, the Mongong Abdul Rahman lived. And of course, a few hundred years before he came to Singapore, there was an active trading settlement. As I show you some of the artifacts that you have seen, that attest to it that it was always at the mouth of the Singapore River has been a popular place of residence for the past uh, seven, eight hundred years. Uh, we don't really know how the Mongol Abdul Rahman looked like, or even this, uh, and his contemporaries. We do have a description, or only two description of the Sultan, uh, Sultan Hussein, a not very pleasant, uh, a flattering uh, review of him. Uh, although it's much later, it was, it, was, it was done in 1830s by this naturalist, uh, George Burnett. He came by Singapore and then he described in very unflattering terms of how an uh, uh, individual possessing the intelligence of an orangutan and was dirty, sarong and stuff, he looks listless. No, but back in 1830, uh, Sultan Hussein may not be the man he was in 1819, right? He was a very bitter fellow by that. He felt that he was being betrayed by the Europeans, both the Dutch and the British. You know, his uh, so-called uh, Sultanate has been taken away from him, although he sold it to, to the British in 1824. So he was not really exactly in his best form as well. So perhaps the description, the description may be just in that sense. And he was to die in a few years later, in 1835, in Malacca of all places, as an exile. Here's another description of him by uh, uh, Munshi Abdullah, uh, T.J. Abdullah, in the Hikad Abdullah. Um, it's a very, very long description. Again, not very flattering about him. It's just it's very fat and it's, it's a spreading chest, punched, distended with layers of flesh, ties which meet in the middle, spiny legs without any flesh. Lay feet, so all sort of things which doesn't seem to be very, very kind. Now we don't know when was this description of the Sultan being made. I, I suspect probably around the same time period, around eighteen thirties period. So we don't really know how he looked like or how he behaved at eighteen nineteen or the early eighteen twenty years. So perhaps he must have gone fat over the years from his pension. Uh, but interestingly. Uh, the genealogy of these uh, these individuals are, are quite quite almost very interesting. Um, effectively, Sultan Hussein and Tamuhu Abdul Rahman were cousin-in-laws, right? So it's all related. They intermarried within the, the larger family and stuff. Although uh, in theory, uh, the de facto head of Singapore was Sultan Hussein, but the de facto ruler of Singapore was uh, Tamuhu Abdul Rahman. This is his turf. What does Sultan Hussein as a titular? Figurehead in so to speak. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, eventually uh, the, the Sultanate of Johor became extinct with uh, the demise of Sultan Hussein and his son, uh, Sultan Ali. And the title, the current Sultan, uh, Sultanate of Johor, derived from the Tomongo Abdul Rahman's line. So it, it's, it's a very interesting story. I and mean, if you get a chance to go upstairs, we'll write up about it in the exhibition. So it's very interesting because the descendants of uh, Sultan Hussein begin. To be the preferred, um, uh, how to say? They they were they, they, they became the preferred uh, partners of the British as opposed to the, the, the Hussein's family. So Abdul Rahman's uh, family rise in prominence after that, and it was Queen Victoria which made the uh, uh, grandson of uh, Abdul Rahman uh, Maja, Maharaja and later Sultan of Johor. So this is quite interesting how the British were to appoint all these sultans in their places. Right, so where is Sultan Hussein's domain? Well, Kampung Lam, as you saw in the earlier image, the little riot village right there, it's so the existing village in Salad Factory, this little compound, we know that, that's right there. I'd like to draw your attention to another area in this view map, right there, Tolok Ayer. Right at Tolok Ayer, end of Tolok Ayer, I'm sorry, you can't really see it right here, but it says Sultan's village. So this is the only the very first uh, uh, documented source that shows that another uh, alternate site or another secondary site which has the Sultan's name on it. Now, we, we don't know whether it's referring to Sultan Hussein or just by chance that it's uh, the guy who owns the place is called Sultan. You know, we don't know. So, but this is quite interesting because this is the earliest evidence for another secondary village out there. 
Uh, back in 20, uh, 2002, uh, we did an excavation at uh, Istana Kampuglang. Uh, it's kind of uh, run down back then, <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, uh, that building itself was built in the mid 19th century, not, not by Sultan Hussein, but by his grandson. So apparently, it, was, it still stands today as the Malay Heritage Center. So you can go visit it. We find all sorts of interesting material. Uh, nothing as early as the uh, early 20th, uh, 19th century period, but you find something from the mid 19th century to early 20th century onwards. Uh, you find things like the gin, uh, ginger beer bottles or soda bottles from Scotland. And things like the, you know, one of those Dutch clocks. You know it's Dutch because at the bottom it says Green Holland, right? So it's not too difficult to decipher it. And we do find funny things like royal chrysanthemum tea because it's a royal compound. Of course, we have to bring it to this kind of place. <laughs> <laughs> jokes aside, these are archaeological records, so archaeologists will come back in a thousand years to uh, try to figure out what this, uh, these things are. Right. So a little bit of of very little description of what really happened on uh, Raffles, the description of Raffles himself, or what happened on, in, on the treaty, so the treaty day itself, about the people involved in the treaty. You know there are a few people, there's always a description of the Orang Lao or Sea people. Uh, there's a company of, of uh, uh, Indian sepoy soldiers, a company of, uh, of European artillery men, a few ship's captains, there were six ships, and they managed to stop another uh, four or five ships that were sailing by from different places in the world. You see the Danish men who came by and they, they try to make their situ uh, the, the event more uh, much formal pomp and circumstance. So they invited John Adams, the political secretary, to uh, Lord Hastings that everything was very successful. No, oh, it's just a few days, barely a week after the signing, right? And he left on February 7. And by, even then, he restarted the port was really very successful. Um, Ports, plentiful supply of fish and turtle. Um, this is most abundant here than any part of archipelago. I mean, how does he know that? He's been here for a few days, right? So he's a bit of a, he tends to exaggerate a lot of things, and he tends to brag. He's kind of a braggart. He tries sort of, uh, I don't know how you say it, but kind of mm, trying to portray a very, very optimistic outlook to the people in India. Well, of course, for his letter to reach them, it takes about two and a half months, right? to get back to India. So how would they know? So he, he portrays a lot of these very, very optimistic type of, uh, of, of, of um, events and things. He mentions a few very interesting things as well, like uh, timber abounds on the island, uh, and large part of the population already engaged in building boats and vessels. Now how is that, how is that possible? Right? And the Chinese are really import, employed in smelting thing all. So this is the first evidence that they are, the Chinese are apart from just planting GMB or working as laborers in, in Singapore. They were already smelting tin. And where does tin come from? The closest place uh, of tin at that point, 1819, was being mined, was Bangka, Bangka Islands. Uh, at one point, Farquhar was the temporary uh, uh, governor of, of Bangka in the early uh, 19th century. So they were really mining tin as smelting in Singapore. Of course, later tin was become one of the, uh, Singapore was become one of the biggest uh, smelting, uh, tin smelting facility in uh, Southeast Asia or Asia, right? And for our brownie itself, the tin works. Uh, uh, he goes on. I, 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 didn't, I didn't copy out everything, but he goes on and on about telling uh, John Adams how great this place was, and this is the most convenient place for, for, for everyone. It's seven days to China, two days to Borneo, uh, three days to, to East Java, to Java. Well, all this are nonsense. Uh, if you really read through the, the, the letters and stuff from upstairs, you realize that Raffles himself took more than 14 days just to get to Vancouver from Singapore. It took him nine days to get to Penang. So, and he's not walking, he's taking a boat, right? So what's, what's going on here? So he, he tends to exaggerate all these things. He's trying to tell people that, wow, this is a great port and everything. Everything is very fantastic. He's trying to persuade his superiors, or perhaps in, in, in built in his mind, he wants to see the, the, the good side or optimistic uh, side of, of things. Raffles, in a sense, is a romantic. He started writing all these things. Again, to John Adams on the same letter. He said, this town, which was founded in the 12th century, is situated on the northern side of the speech, which as well as the islands it had given its name. So the streets of Singapore and of course Singapore Island itself, right? So he says 12th century, now how does he know that? So we'll come to that in a while. 
And he wrote to his good friend, the Duchess of Somerset, a few days later, on the 22nd of February. This is a spot, the site of ancient maritime capital of the Malays, and within the walls of these ancient fortifications, raised not less than six centuries ago, on which are funded the rich flag. And he wrote to Colonel Adam Brook, this is his, like the military attaché, the ADC to uh, Princess Charlotte, the, the, the princess who would have been queen of, of England, in line to be the queen of England. So refer to the extremity of the Malay Peninsula, where you observe several small islands forming the streets of Singapore. On one of these are the ruins of the ancient capital of Singapura, or the city of Lyon, as it's called in Malay. So he's, he really has all these things in his mind. Now where did he get all this information from? You couldn't make them up like 12th century, 6th century ago. What, what's going on? Well, he read the Malay annuals. So the genealogy of the kings. And he studied them very thoroughly. And from there, he, he surmised that this must be the city. This must be the old capital. And he envisions himself as, a, as, as an empire builder who revived the old ancient great kingdom. It became, it's it kind of a bit like a Caesar complex type of thing, like reviving the ancient kingdom to something and recreated. Uh, not everyone thinks that way. Uh, John Crawford, uh, another ship captain who accompanied him on, on, on uh, to the founding of Singapore. He's also a surveyor. He's a Captain Daniel Ross is a good friend. So there are two ships to them surveying ships. So he's, he's on the ship investigator. So this part of the grounds is inside a very ancient city and fort of Singapore. No remnants of its former grandeur exist. Not the slightest vestige of it has ever been discovered. As for the strength of the fortifications, no remains are to be seen, excepting by those processing a fertile imagination. They can trace all this. So he literally poo pooed the uh, reference that thing about all this stuff, right? <coughs> the previous slides were just some samples. If you really to read the law of the letters which he sent out to everybody, William Masters, Lord Hastings, and stuff, he repeat the same thing over and over again. That, oh, this is the great capital of, the, 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 of, of ancient Singapore, of the Lion City, blah, 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 blah. It's almost like cutting and pasting the email, right? It just takes the same thing and repeats it over and over again. That's so in a way, I guess he wants to be it as well. But let's see what sort of uh, archaeological evidence or cartographic or historical evidence are there to support Raffles in, in his romance and fantasy. This is another plan of Singapore Harbour, probably the earliest as well, but February 1819, by Daniel Ross, the same guy I didn't. This was published in the newspaper in Calcutta a few months later. And if you notice carefully, right in this corner, so again, this is just, uh, remember, they are, they are hydrographers, right? They're interested in the sea routes, not so much as the things on land. But fortunately for us, they actually, oops, sorry. Fortunately for us, he actually recorded a few things right there, like this. He actually wrote down there, there's a little squarish looking thing. It's all walls of the village. So what is that? Can that be right? And let's take, take a look at this. There's a Sultan's Negri of Negra there. Nagara is a compound or royal, royal firth, something like that, right? Let's take a look at some other cartographic uh, maps. This is in 1825. Uh, it's in the British Library. But we don't know who's the, the author of it. But this is the, the specific area that he's referring to about the ancient walls and fortifications of Singapore. Now, if I, I blow it up a little, you can really see up here. It says old lines in Singapore. Now, this is a very archaic term. What's old lines? You know, what does it mean? The Nazca lines or the lines or Stone Age lines. No, it's not. It's this old lines meaning old military lines, the defensive lines of Singapore. And apparently it existed even up to 1825. And Raffles in his very fertile imagination recognizes it. Now what else do we have? Uh, unfortunately Raffles himself didn't describe how did those walls or ancient lines, or at least we, we haven't had any records of him, perhaps he was sank with the ship. But we got someone else, John Crawford, another John Crawford, uh, not to be mistaken with the, the other John Crawford who, who, who sort of dismisses the Raffles claim. This is John Crawford, not the ship captain or surveyor, but the uh, second resident of Singapore. He's a, he's a medical man, and Raffles later appointed him in 1823 uh, to take over from William Farquhar to govern Singapore. But he came to Singapore earlier, uh, as, as on, on the way to uh, Siam and Cochin China on, uh, on a mission, on a diplomatic mission from India to have uh, open up trade. 
So he came to Singapore, a stopover, and he said, um, 3rd of February 1822, he said, this morning I walked around the walls and limits of the ancient town of Singapore. Or such in reality had been the site of a modern settlement. So the modern settlements begin to these things. So he goes on to explain what it is. It highlighted the the wall, which is about 16 feet in breadth and space, and at present about 8 or 9 in height, runs from very near the mouth from the sea to the base of the hill, which is uh, Singapore Hill or Fort Canning Hill. Until we read the salt marsh. <coughs> so he goes on to describe what there's this little ditch, there's little gulf and stuff like that. So he actually walked around it. Now the wall itself, uh, I know a lot of people think that the defensive wall must be brick, you know, like the Great Wall of China or, or fortification made of stone. No, in this case, very common uh, uh, defensive walls in, in this part of the world are usually a uh, ramp earth, earth mound. Earth mound and mounted by uh, uh, stockade of uh, timber or even spikes or something like that. Uh, the timber, the, the, there's no mention of timber. Apparently, this earth mound is still seen right here, along these lines. Just like the 1825 map, let's go back in time to about 1820. It says there itself, old lines of Singapore. I'm sorry, you can't really see it. It's tiny, but highlighted, that's the old lines of Singapore. So everything within on the left of, of these lines was the new and ancient settlement of Singapore. And of course, the, the Tamogu Abdul Rahman's little settlement over there by Empress Street as well. Now, we don't really know when the Tamogu Abdul Rahman first set foot in Singapore. There's, there's all sorts of different dates that he has given to people and different conjectures by different people. <coughs> Some people think he just came here uh, a few months before Raffles arrived, in, uh, which means about 1818. There are others who think, or at least he told someone he came here in 1811. But yet he told somebody else he came here in 1805. So we don't really know <coughs> when exactly. We can only say roughly at the turn of the 19th century.